Hi, I'm Jim Baugh, and I'm with Global Training Network and have the privilege of coming to you this morning, uh, bringing God's truth. <clears throat> you might ask, where in the world are, am I? Let's see if I can get that English right. Well, I'm uh, kind of in an alleyway, and uh, there's a big wall of separation here between me and uh, probably a few hundred tons of dirt. But I just thought it's a unique area to be able to bring the word to you. Because we're going in Malachi this morning, Malachi chapter 1. And if you want to know where Malachi is, just go to Matthew and turn left. Okay, It's the last book of the Old Testament. And it's an interesting book, and I thought I'd just bring you maybe a one-message uh, aspect from the book of Malachi, because I've got a couple more weeks I'd like to do some more messages on grace. But uh, just to give an example of how God's grace is so evident in the Old Testament, uh, many times people say, well, I love to write the, read the New Testament because it's so full of grace, it's so full of God's love. At the same time, I want to give you an example of the reality of God's great love demonstrated in the Old Testament. So before we get started, would you pray with me as we begin? Father, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for the power that is in it. Thank you for your grace, your mercy, your love. Thank you for the uh, prophet Malachi and the truths that you want to bring through us to us through his ministry that took place so many hundreds of years ago. Thank you for your purpose and plan with Israel and with us, and that your promises always come true. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, let's begin by reading Malachi uh, chapter 1, verses 1 through 9. The oracle of the word of the Lord to Israel by Malachi. I have loved you, says the Lord. But you say, how have you loved us? Is not Esau Jacob's brother, declares the Lord? Yet I have loved Jacob, but Esau I have hated. I have laid waste his hill country and left his heritage to jackals of the desert. If Edom says, we are shattered, but we will rebuild the ruins, the Lord of hosts says, they may build, but I'll tear it down. And they will be called the wicked country and the people with whom the Lord is angry forever. Your own eyes shall see this, and you shall say, Great is the Lord beyond the borders of Israel. God was saying this because the nations that surrounded Israel were constantly uh, seeking to destroy them. A son honors his father, and a servant his master. If then I am a father, where's my honor? God says. And if I'm a master, where's my fear? Says the Lord of hosts to you. O priests who despise my name. But you say, How have we despised your name? And God answers, by offering polluted food upon my altar. But you say, um, how have we polluted you? God answers, by saying that the Lord's table may be despised. When you offer blind animals in sacrifice, is that not evil? And when you offer those that are lame or sick, is that not evil? Present that to your governor. Will he accept you or show you favors, says the Lord of hosts? And now entreat the favor of God that he may be gracious to us. With such a gift from your hand, we will show favor to any of you, says the Lord of hosts. Oh, I wish God says there are those among you who did not shut the doors. God's plea with Israel is seen very evident here. Um, we've read his word. Now I want to get into the teaching of it in Malachi chapter 1, because we have to ask the question, what does this mean to my life today? How do I understand the truth of Scripture, interpret it properly to the people that it was written to, and then make application of it by the power of the Spirit to my life? And as I begin, I want to uh, tell you about a guy whose name was Robert Robinson. Does that name sound familiar to you? Probably to many of us, not. But um, we might not even know his place in history, but I want to share with you what that place is. Some of us, because some of us know the words of an old hymn he wrote a long time ago called, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. Is that song coming to mind? Come thou fount of every blessing, tune my heart to sing thy praise. Does that sound familiar? Jesus sought me when a stranger, 
wandering from the fold of God. He who rescued me from danger interposed his precious blood. You remember the reprise. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart. Oh, take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. You probably remember that song now, but Robert wrote those words not long after he met Christ, after listening to George, George Whitfield. If you know a little bit of church, of church history, you know that the uh, Great Awakening in the United States came as a result of the preaching of great men of God. One of them was named George Whitfield, and he came from England. He was a well-known evangelist. And um, so <clears throat> Robert and some of his drinking buddies heard that George was going to be preaching, and they went to, um, to heckle Whitfield to disrupt the meeting. But instead of disrupting the meeting, they became disciples of Jesus. They all came to Christ. And as a result, Robert became a pastor. Um, but as his life continued on, his, his attitude of anger towards people, his, his lack of people skills as a pastor in the churches that he served, um, and he moved on from one church after another, after another, after another, until he left the ministry. He was literally broken by his own bitterness towards people. Not long after he left the ministry, he was riding in a public carriage in the town, and a young woman that was sitting in the carriage began to sing these words. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Take my heart, oh, take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. And Robert began to weep. His, his eyes filled with tears, and the tears rolled down his cheek. And the woman stopped singing. She was so moved by his emotion, and she asked him um, why he was so upset. Why was he weeping? Why was he crying? Um, was it the hymn that she sang, or was it the way that she sang it? And he said, ma'am, I am the poor, unhappy man who wrote that hymn many years ago and would give a thousand worlds if I had them to enjoy the feelings and a close walk with God that I had then. He had fulfilled the words of his own hymn, hadn't he? Due to unresolved anger and unresolved bitterness, perhaps unfulfilled expectations that he had about God and how God would perhaps use him, and also the hurt that he had had from other people, Robertson's relationship with God had been left behind. And it wasn't God who walked away. It was Robert. Does this story remind you of anyone this morning? Perhaps it's you. <laughs> perhaps you've been going through the motions in your walk with God, and your heart has been prone to walk away from the God that you once professed to love con todo su corazón, with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, with all your strength. It's so easy to do, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it, prone to leave the God I love. But the answer is to recommit your heart to him. Here's my heart, oh, take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. That problem, men and women, that each one of us face on a regular or irregular basis in our walk with God is a problem that Robert had. But not only Robert, we all discover that sense of, of falling out of love with Jesus. In fact, that's what Jesus wrote to the church in Laodicea. He says, I have this one thing against you. What? That you have left your first love. But there's a book in the Old Testament, and the book is called Malachi, named after the prophet, that deals with the same problem. It was the problem for God's people who had left the God they loved. They had been delivered from 
uh, the captivity of Babylon, and they had been returned to the land, and they thought somehow, some way, that God's kingdom would come rolling in, and they would be reestablished as the unshakable, unbreakable kingdom of God. But God said the time is not yet. <laughs> in fact, he has had yet to send his Messiah, Jesus, who, in fact, when Jesus came, was also rejected because the people wanted a king, not a savior. They wanted, in essence, a burger king, John chapter 6, who would feed them breakfast every morning, but not a savior who would calm and heal and save their sin-soaked souls. It's tough to admit that we have sinned. It's tough to admit at times that we're broken and beyond repair, that only Christ can repair us. Let's remove the mystery behind Malachi's history. In verse 1, we talk about the man. In Hebrew, the, the name Malachi, it says the, the oracle of the word of the Lord by Malachi. And the name, um, actually Malachi, means messenger, which points to Malachi's role as a prophet of the Lord, delivering God's message to God's people, again, who had been back in Israel for over 100 years. The word oracle literally uh, means one who brings a burden. Malachi is God's messenger who carries this burden that he has to share with God's people to address the problem that is pandemic among them. And what's the problem? Their love for God and the things of God had grown lax. They had, in essence, fallen out of love with God. They no longer care. They lost their love for the Lord. They'd been delivered from exile, again, only to expect God to send in his Messiah to establish this everlasting kingdom. But again, that hadn't happened yet. And God tells his people again in Malachi that Messiah will come. And even when he comes, they're not ready to receive him on his terms, are they? In fact, God promises to send his messenger to prepare the way for the coming Messiah. And that's exactly the words John the Baptist uses in John chapter 1 to introduce Jesus as the promised Messiah, the Messiah of Israel. And the whole four centuries after, uh, four whole centuries after Malachi was written. Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. John was the messenger that Malachi promised in the fourth chapter. And in view of all this, God still calls them back to himself. Malachi tells us that God never stops loving his own. And I'll tell you that today. God never has stopped loving you. Even though your heart has grown cold, perhaps, maybe your heart is aflame with the love of God, but maybe it's also grown lax or cold, and you just think, I'm just going through the motions, and men and women, going through the motions gets us absolutely nowhere, right? We're moving quick, but going nowhere fast. Jesus is the great lover of our soul, and God says in verse 1 of Malachi chapter 1, I have loved you. Jeremiah 31.3 tells us that God loves his people with an everlasting love. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn you or to condemn me, but that the world through him might be saved. God loves us. In fact, he says to his people, I have loved you and I continue to love you. God's people begin this conversation with him a bit, a bit like having a conversation with a spoiled brat that has a chip on his shoulder. God says, I have loved you. And notice at the end of verse 2, after God tells them he has loved them, what do they say? How have you loved us? You can just hear the bitterness dripping in their voice. It sounds like, oh yeah, really? Really? You love us? Can you clarify one way that love has been demonstrated? Because I'm just not feeling the love, God. God tells them that his love has been demonstrated. In verses 3 through 5, God gives some examples. The first way that God's love has been demonstrated is the fact that he has chosen them to be his own. 
He chose Yaakov, Jacob, over Esau. Number two, God has also protected them from all the enemies that surround them. Even though Israel came back out of captivity, they were still surrounded by enemies who wanted to destroy them. And they're sitting there going, God, are you going to, you know, are you going to take some names and move them out? When are you going to come to our aid? And maybe that's your cry this morning. I've prayed and prayed and prayed. When is God going to answer my prayer? May I remind you, God never makes mistakes and you're not going to be his first. God has a plan for our lives. The third way that God loved Israel was that even though everyone on the borders of Israel wanted to destroy them, like they're wanting to do today, they themselves, the enemies of God, will be removed one day when God's righteous rule comes. In essence, God tells Malachi's people, God tells his people through Malachi, to count their blessing in those times when you feel like God's love for you is non-existent because of the disappointments and the pain that you're now in. You remember that old song? When, a, when upon life's billows you are tempest-tossed. When you are discouraged thinking all is lost. What are we to do? Count our many blessings. Name them one by one. And it will surprise each one of us what the Lord has done, right? God says, I love you. And too often we say, how's that, God? You love us? Have you looked at what my family's going through lately? My finances or maybe what my physical condition is in? I mean, I went to the doctor and he said, I got good news and bad news. The good news is that you've got 24 hours to live. The bad news is, I should have told you yesterday. You know, the old joke. Is there a drum roll for that one? But we do go through difficult times. This world is not our home. Amen? It's not a nice place. God says, I have never stopped loving you in all that you're going through. And I'll tell you this, God's love never fails. It never gives up. It never, ever stops short in our lives. God demonstrated his love for us, even that while we were yet sinners, the Bible says Christ died for us. And we say, God, if you love me, why was my pay cut? Have you seen the gas costs lately, Lord? Could we just kind of compress a few more dinosaurs here and help our president get the drills going so we could have the gas that we need and have the happy life that we think we know what is. <laughs> That's terrible English, but it sounded a little bit like Yoda. Know what is. But do we know what the happy life consists of? The happy life actually is the holy life where we're walking with God. Like Peter, when Jesus calls him to get out of the boat with, to walk with him on the water, too often we focus on the waves and the storm around us and ke instead of keeping our eyes fixed and focused on Jesus, right? Our love for the Lord is easily lost. We've all heard the statement, our life speaks much louder than our words, correct? In other words, the way we live our lives, our actions are always a badge of proof to what we say we value. A man was talking to his friend about their fifth wedding anniversary, and he said, hey, for our fifth wedding anniversary, I took my wife to Hawaii. Man says, wow, that's incredible. What a great idea. What do you think you're going to do for your 50th anniversary? And the guy says, I think for my 50th, I'll go back to Hawaii and pick her up. <laughs> that's not funny, I know. But what we do proves what we value and what we truly love. Jesus put it like this, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also, right? If I say I love the Lord, but I'm not actively giving him first place in everything I do, do I really love him? God told his people, I love you, but you don't love me. I know that because of your offensive offerings. I read this already in verses 5 through 8, but I'll read it again. 
Um, actually, verses 6 through 8. If I can get my, my verses here. Oh, it says, A son honors his father and a servant his master. If, if then I am a father, where's my honor? God says. And if I'm a master, where's my fear, says the Lord of hosts, to you, O priests, who despise my name? In, what, you're in the ministry, but you despise the Lord you claim you serve. But you say, how have we despised your name? By offering polluted food upon my altar. But you say, Lord, oh, oh, by saying that the Lord's table may be despised. When you offer blind animals in sacrifice, is that not evil? When you offer those that are lame or sick, is that not evil? Present that to your governor. Will he accept you or show you favors, says the Lord God? God, God goes to the priests and says, you despise me. And yet you're involved in leading people of, to worship. And, and they say, well, how have we done that? And God says, by giving an altar to me, on the, an offering on the altar, that you wouldn't even give to your elected officials. Hmm. In essence, God says, try offering a diseased animal that you just barbecued to the governor when he stops by for a little nosh. Would he accept that kind of meal? Try doing that to your friends when they stop over for dinner. Bring all the leftovers out, especially the ones stuck way back in the back of the fridge where the light can't get to, and serve those. Say, you know, hey, Bill, don't mind the mold on the meatloaf. If you put hot sauce on it and leave it in the microwave for 20 minutes, you'll never know the difference, and it will kill all the bacteria anyways. We'd never do that to our friends. But that's the kind of leftover offering God's people were bringing to him. And the priests were complacent in offering it to God. Why? Because they would eat the cut, the choice cuts of meat and give the other to God. You've heard about the guy during offering time in church. The plate gets to him and he starts going through the plate. The son says, Dad, what are you doing? You got to pass the plate on. I'm just making change, son. Just making change. Hmm. Later on in this book, God says to his people, Will a man rob God? And God's people retort, How have we robbed you? And what does God say? You've robbed me by not giving the tithes and offerings that are mine. It's a lot more difficult to provide our tithes and offerings of faith to the Lord out of love when prices escalate, isn't it? But I think that makes the offering even more meaningful. Because an offering is only honoring to God if we give it by faith. We know that God's going to provide for us. Later on in our marriage, I took over the finances, and because my wife had been struggling with physical illness, I discovered that uh, we had not given our offering as we had planned, because she just had not, uh, you know, and all of the things going on with her physical health uh, provided those checks, and so I said, I've got to update our offerings to the Lord, and uh, the amount of of the offering was $800. I knew, I knew that we could never um, do that. I mean, I looked in our checking account and we had $800. And I thought, is this really being wise in giving everything but maybe a chunk of change to the Lord at this time? But yet I knew that God wanted me to trust him. And so, I was a pastor in a church. I was close to the treasurer's box in the hallway. And I wrote out that check. And I put it in the box. And a great sense of joy came over me. It's almost like God says, watch how I provide. My hand shook as I put it in the box. You know, it's like... Stuck it in there. I went back to my desk thinking that was kind of cool, but it was also kind of scary at the same time. Hmm. Just about that, about, I don't know, it was like half an hour, 45 minutes later, 
we received a phone call. I received a phone call from a couple who had sold their home in Mesa, Arizona, and had moved to California. And the, uh, the woman said, hi, Jim. Hey, how are you doing? I said, great. How are you guys doing? How was your move? Have you found a home? And they said, yeah, we, uh, we found a place and we mailed you a card a few days ago. We just wanted to call you to tell you we're kind of excited about it. But uh, we want to send you a gift just to bless your family for uh, the ministry that you've had in our, our family's life. And so um, I said, wow, thank you. She didn't tell me anything about amount. I'm, and I'm not asking, well, how much was it? We talked for a while. I prayed with them. Just thank God for God's provision for them and their travel. And um, at the end of the day, I went to the mailbox, and there was the card. I opened the card up, and there was a card saying, thank you for your years of ministry. And inside the card was a check. This is a true story. I opened the check up, and the amount of the check was for $800. I discovered once more that day, I can never outgive God. And yes, I tithed on the 800, okay? I'm just saying. <laughs> I didn't give for once, and this is not a, this is in humility. I didn't want to give God my leftovers. And God blessed the gift for his honor, his glory. And even if he hadn't, there would still be joy in my heart in giving to God who I cannot give. I mean, when the little kid brought the fish and the loaf to Jesus, he didn't give Jesus half a nod on a uh, roll. He didn't give Jesus a pan of fish heads because he had taken all the other fish off and had a little tantalizing snack. He gave Jesus his best because he loved him. And God multiplied it. Not only were God's people's offerings offensive, but all the ministers of God, all the pastors and leaders had sort of a ho-hum ministry uh, ideal as well. They were they were bored with God. Have you ever been bored with God? God is not boring, I'll tell you that. The priests are lame, the offerings are lame, and the people's love for God is lame as well. And it sounds like the church you hate going to, but you know you have to go. They start at 11 o'clock sharp and end at 12 o'clock dull. And I think too often all of us are tempted in time's sin because we treat the God who loves us in sort of a whole hum way. Come to worship on Sundays? Oh man, you know, I've got so many other things pressing for my attention. Uh, when the kids' sports season or my grandkids' sports season is over or when my other responsibilities taper off, it's a tournament weekend, okay? When I get that bonus, I'll start giving. Maybe someday, maybe I'll serve God somehow. But right now, I've got other more important things to do that God has news for us he doesn't want us to be involved in a ho-hum ministry he says come to me and I will show you great and mighty things of which you do not even know and he has a passion a desire to reach the nations and we can be a part of what he's doing in reaching the nations globally before Christ returns here's the truth when God calls us to place him first in our time, our talent, and treasure, he has no desire to take anything away from us. Actually, he wants to give us an opportunity to partner with him in the redemptive work he's doing right now across the street and around the world. God wants to reach people and make disciples more than we want to. And anyone who will step up to the plate and say, how can I be involved in the process? I'm telling you, God will bless and provide for that individual. In the future, and this is the reason, in verses 11 and 14, Malachi says this. He says, But for the, from the rising of the sun to its setting, my name will be great among the nations, 
And in every place incense will be offered to my name and a pure offering. For my name will be great among the nations, says the Lord of hosts. God has a plan. God has a plan for your life. God has a plan for my life. God has a plan for the nations. And he is redeeming the nations right now, even as he said in Malachi chapter 1. He said, listen, from the setting of the sun to the rising of the sun, my name will be praised. And according to Revelation 5 and Revelation chapter 7, the Bible says that there will be people from every ethnic group before the Lamb of God saying, worthy is the Lamb that was slain. There will be no unreached people groups standing before or outside the gates of glory going, I wish someone would have told me. Because God's sovereign purpose in energizing us and envisioning us to reach the world for Christ will always, always be provided for with his blessing. I love what uh, Psalm 86, 9 says to repeat the theme of Malachi 1, 11. This is the New Living Translation. All the nations you made will come and bow before you, Lord. They will praise your holy name. How will God do this? See, God uses our time. God uses our talent. God uses our worship, our praise of him. The, uh, the offerings that we give him first in to bring glory and honor to his name, to reach the world with the good news of Jesus. Refugee camps in Germany, because of the Syrians who left during the Syrian conflict, are seeing great movements of God from a retired Luftwaffe pilot who came to Christ through a Catholic discipleship ministry. <laughs> That's right. Men and women, God is moving in ways that are not bound by some denomination's theology. This priest in Germany was born again as a result of Campus Crusade, or CRU, the same organization that I'm working with in Rwanda, providing tablets that have the Gospel of Luke um, enacted in the Jesus film. They're the ones that are providing and, and the funds behind these tablets. And by the way, I did that training in Rwanda just last week, and... I pray it multiplies powerfully for the glory of God. This pilot, this former Luftwaffe German pilot, was led to Christ by his priest using the four spiritual laws, Campus Crusade, and now he's sharing the Jesus film to Syrian refugees, and thousands of these former Muslims have come to Christ. The fastest growing evangelical church in the world right now and I'll have to check the statistics again, but I believe it's Iran. God is moving so powerfully across this planet to make his name great. And I'll tell you this, when the night is darkest, the light shines the brightest. Amen. All he asks us to do, all he calls us to do, is to fall so deeply in love and receive his love and begin partnering with him. And be empowered by him to give ourselves to make his name great wherever we may be and wherever he may send us. Will you commit yourselves to make his name great? Will you commit yourselves to a, a ministry of excitement, not a ministry of ho-hum, I'm bored to death? Among your neighbors, will you make a commitment to, to be a light among your neighbors? Will you... Make a commitment to be a light among the nations. You say, well, how can I make his name great? I want to give you three things and we're going to close. Number one, pray. Pray for those who do not yet know Jesus. Pray for their salvation. There's an organization called Operation World. It's www.operationworld.com that you can find out people groups around the world who have yet to hear the name of Jesus. Pray for them. Pray for your neighbors. Pray for the nations. Number two, give. Give as God directs you. There are ministries strategically pointed to reach the nations with the gospel, to have a global impact. And without full funding from God's people here, we can't fulfill the ministry God has called us to, to reach others for Christ over there. And the final thing is, go. Go, go across the street, go around the world, wherever God takes you to share his grace-filled good news. God is moving. But remember, 
5,000 miles does not make a missionary. We continue to make disciples here. We must share our faith, disciple, encourage, teach, strengthen, baptize, make disciples until Jesus comes. All in all, as we close our time together, let's recommit our lives this week to give God our best. Will you? Amen. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the ministry of your word that's taking place around the world. And I pray, even as Malachi's words from you come true, that your name will be made great from the rising of the sun to its setting all around the world. We pray for those who are yet to hear the name of Jesus, that you'd use us in some way to introduce them. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. May God bless you. May he keep you. May his face shine upon you and give you his peace. I'll see you next week.